Good afternoon. Welcome to our January 19th work session. Up first, we have a COVID-19 vaccine update with Earl Stoner. Earl, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. All righty. So I have to I have to apologize. I have another call to be on at five. So stop me if I'm going too fast. I know you probably have questions. Um, so currently, we are finishing up phase 1A. Um, of vaccinations um, again and just to remind everyone that's uh health care workers uh, first responders ems fire law enforcement frontline judiciary uh, staff and then anyone licensed under a board that is under the maryland department of health and um, also uh, the nursing home residents and staff although uh, we aren't doing those locally those are um, under a federal partnership a federal program with uh, Walgreens and CVS. Uh, they are contracted to do, nationally actually, to do um, residents and staff of nursing homes. Uh, we are beginning, as of yesterday, to uh, ease into uh, phase 1B. Uh, that is, uh, entails, uh, first and foremost, assisted living facilities, uh, congregate living facilities, who are technically, uh, like um, other long-term care, they're technically under the federal program, However, the state was concerned that the rollout was uh, a little slower than they were anticipating. So they asked um, any uh, health departments who would like to uh, help in expediting that if they were uh, interested, uh, let the state know. Of course, uh, we were interested. Um, and so we are going to be uh, uh, administering vaccine to the um, congregate living facilities here in Washington County. Also under that uh, sort of priority in 1B are adults 75 and over. Um, in our partnership with Meredith, um, they are going to be uh, working with uh, those individuals. Um, and then also under 1B, but we'll, we'll, what we'll get to in the next couple of weeks is uh, K through 12 education, child care providers, and continuity of government. Um, I have been told by Meredith um, that they will be uh, giving or allotting um, a thousand doses of vaccine to the school system. Um, you know, originally with Meredith, uh, we had uh, planned on really focusing on those vulnerable, vulnerable populations, uh, but they made the decision um, with the doses that they get uh, to allow the uh, school system those thousand doses for I think it's either this week or, or next week's allotment that they get. Um, so again, uh, we're really focusing on, in, in our chart from um, the governor's office and from the state at this point in time, are, is focused on the vulnerable populations um, and specific to us, as I mentioned, congregate living facilities and the uh, age 75 and older. Um, I know that Meredith has a uh, waiting list of about, I believe it was about 4,000 individuals um, in, in the senior population. Um, that are interested in being vac vaccinated and uh, they will be uh, scheduling those individuals uh, with an appointment to uh, be administered the vaccine. Um, again, as I mentioned, we're finishing 1A and 1B. Um, as I mentioned, the state directed health departments and hospitals uh, to give priority to those vulnerable populations. Um, continuity of government, we don't have a definition yet from the uh, state we are supposed to receive today more clarity on what continuity of government actually means and who fits under that. But once we know that, we will uh, begin contacting uh, the city, county, and, and the municipalities moving forward um, and uh, getting individuals uh, signed up to be vaccinated. Um, I guess one of the things, just from a challenge perspective, uh, we receive, the health department receives about 1,300 doses a week um, the state receives about 72,500 a week. Um, of that, uh, about 25, 26,000 is carved off and it goes to that nursing home population that's being uh, administered through the federal program, uh, which really leaves about 50,000 doses each week for the entire state. Um, we have been told for the foreseeable future, our allotment is probably going to remain uh, steady at the 13, 1400 dose range. Um, so you can see from a challenge perspective, you know, the doses that we get in don't necessarily meet the demand. 
Um, also, another challenge really is limited staffing, uh, maybe even a bigger challenge than the uh, doses that the limited doses that we get. Um, finding uh, available individuals who are willing to be vaccinators is uh, about like pulling teeth these days. Um, they're in very, very short supply and heavy demand. Um, and then the other big sort of precluding uh, factor in all this is really the storage and handling of the vaccines. Um, these two vaccines are, while they're great, don't get me wrong, uh, it, it's great to have light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, these two vaccines are unlike any vaccines that we've ever um, experienced before from a, a, a storage and a handling perspective. You know, with a flu vaccine, you can, you know, package those up, go out, you know, to a mobile site um, under a tent or in, in a building somewhere, and you don't have to worry about uh, the vaccine going bad. It can be re-refrigerated. But with these vaccines, uh, once they're taken out of the freezer and thawed, you have six hours to use them. Um, and then once each vial is punctured, um, you have that six hours to use it. So uh, if you're getting like, say one dose out of a vial, and then you have other doses, basically nine other doses sitting in that vial, you gotta figure out what to do with it because you don't wanna waste it. So, uh, you know, we're just asking for everyone to be patient. Um, you know, there are uh, other, um, avenues that the state is exploring, for instance, uh, expanding out to pharmacies, I uh, believe next week. I don't have the details yet, but our Martin stores um, in the North End and out on the dual highway are gonna be participating in a pilot uh, vaccination program through the state. Again, I don't know the details of that as of yet, but they're in the process now of really expanding out from the health department and from the hospital. But again, there's still only about 50,000 doses that we have available. Um, so expanding it just basically um, doesn't expand the number of doses that we have. So I know that there are probably questions, but I wanted to give you kind of a, a quick overview of that. Thank you. Do you guys have questions for Earl? I mean, I don't know. First of all, thanks for coming on and explaining that uh, to us. And not just us, but I think our citizens more so. I don't mm -hmm. know that I have questions as much as I do a comment. I feel like we're about two weeks removed from a process that, that it's refreshing to hear last week because I work in Frederick County for a small town there. And so uh, I think the conversations that your office and uh, your hospitals and doctors and distributors are having over the last two weeks getting uh, the vaccine and getting it out to the public in, in the way the state wanted uh, isn't much different in that county or other counties across the state than it was here. So one, I wanted to applaud your efforts in sort of being in charge of, of cats almost uh, uh, in, in that regard, you know, because it's not something we, we really, or, or not we, but you've, you know, uh, uh, been given that, that, that charge uh, before to do. Uh, but we got a lot of feedback from seniors after we read the article in the paper. I mean, I mean that's, for me, that's the bottom line. That's why I made the comments that I did and just said, look, you know, we need to do better than we're doing and making sure people are getting the right information at the right time in the right manner uh, to ensure that they're not being skipped over, that they're not being forgotten, uh, that we know what we're doing uh, and that we're being fair. Uh, and, and so, you know, I applaud your efforts just as much as I do. Uh, uh, Dr. Josh, you called and said, hey, look, uh, and I think just as you explained here a little bit ago, um, we're getting this stuff. It isn't like a pill you can just put on a shelf uh, and we can't, it's great to see a pyramid on paper but you can't force people all in that one group to come in. You give a number, you expect that many, you don't get them. You don't want to get, you don't want the doses to go bad. And so you want to get them out to the public because you see the numbers just like we do going up and up and you don't want to lose that supply and the time associated with it. So uh, I definitely have a much better perspective now. I think we're doing a little bit better of a job of communicating uh, on our end, that information to the public. Uh, but I think for me, my most pivotal part is that the seniors uh, especially sort of aren't left out of the information communication process because they're not on Facebook, frankly, uh, uh, you know, they're reading the Herald Mail uh, uh, much more traditionally than I think uh, uh, other uh, segments of the population uh, age groups are, are getting their information. Earl, I know you have to go at, at five, but do you guys have any other questions for him? Just want to say thanks, Earl. Thank you. yeah, thank you. uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good. All right.
right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank got you, got you yeah. done right at five. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Off to the next one. <laughs> have a good one. All right. Up next, we have preliminary agenda review. I guess stop me if you have questions. We'll have a 7 o'clock regular session. We're having an executive session before that. Yes. What time? Uh, 6.50. All right. You go. So 6.50, executive session, 7 o'clock regular session. Call to order, have the invocation, do the pledge, read the announcements, and then we'll have citizen comments. They can email council comments at hagerstownmd.org no later than 5 o'clock next Tuesday. We'll have approval of the minutes from December 1st, December 8th, December 15th. On the consent agenda, the Department of Community and Economic Development Street Closure Request 2021. IT upgrade of ESRI GIS ARC server for 15,500. Parks and Engineering replacement of Parks and Rec office roof for 64,900. Police Department annual Barracuda backup service for $20,544. Uh, police interceptor vehicle purchases for eight 2021 Dodge Police Interceptors for $234,168. Upfitting of those 2021 Dodge Police Interceptors for $96,479.68. Uh, Triband TDMA encrypted radios for interceptors for $58,048.16. Dell Latitude 5424 mobile computers for interceptors, $20,190.88. Public Works, a Ford F-150 Super Cab pickup truck for $30,653. Ford F-750 regular cab truck outfitted for snow operations for $126,276. For utilities, we have electric mill soft utility software for $95,195. Water hack fluoride analyzer for $13,416.22 and wastewater underflow pump for $22,989.08. Have no unfinished business. Under new business, the approval of a resolution, the lease agreement for the City of Hagerstown property located at 36 North Potomac Street, the yard shop. Approval of BMX user agreement addendum. Approval of Maryland Capital Projects grant agreement for BMX track improvements. Approval of policy addition for Department of Community and Economic Development programs and incentives. Approval of updates to the Community Development Block Grant Public Service Review Committee. Approval of Community Development Block Grant Capital Funding. Approval of the request for expansion of the heart of the Civil War Heritage Area. We'll have City Administrator comments, Mayor Council comments, and adjourn. Any questions? All right. Next up, we have Millsoft Utility Solutions, Nathan and Nancy. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Thank you for having us this evening. Uh, we have a uh, presentation for you tonight to review the, uh, the Millsoft utility products that uh, is on the consent agenda this month. Um, the Hagerstown Light Department and Millsoft have been doing business together since 2008. Uh, they provide us with the, uh, a software tool to model our utility infrastructure uh, and layer it on the ESRI ArcGIS system. Uh, that tool provides us the ability to analyze our facilities for overloads and um, you're also our line workers are also able to uh, view those facilities on a on a map um, on their handheld devices on their uh, personal mobile smartphones so they can identify fuse locations and so forth during uh, storm restoration efforts <clears throat> um, so next slide. I... Okay. Uh, so for about a year, um, the light department started to look into better ways to manage our 
work management, and accounting. Um, and we discovered in that process that uh, Millsoft had also acquired a company called Daffron to expand their software toolbox. Um, so in addition to the products that Millsoft already had in place, which was a interactive voice recognition um, or IVR system and outage management systems, they also uh, brought in a work management and customer information system. And all these systems are, are fully integrated. They already talk to one another. There's not a whole lot of programming involved um, in linking all their data together. The work management system, uh, uh, right now everything we do is on paper. Um, uh, paper can get lost and, 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 and then jobs get, uh, get forgotten or, or incomplete. Um, there's, as jobs are completed, they pass through about three to five sets of hands to get all the data entered into the, the system we currently work with. And there's very uh, limited ability to report these, uh, to create reports, to, to view errors and so forth. Um, being an electric utility, we fall under the Federal Power Act. Uh, we need to account for things a little bit differently than the other departments in the city. We have to follow the FERC accounting rules. And it can be a little more complex and uh, the, the system we currently use probably didn't have an electric utility in mind when they, when they programmed it. And what we've, from what we've seen, through uh, software demos, the, the work management system that Daffron provides uh, is, is, is quite an improvement. Um, we're able to report for accuracy. Um, we're able to maintain our assets more accurately um, by date stamping materials in the mapping system. Uh, we're able to easily uh, check a box to compile information for, for uh, invoicing. Um, we, we invoice for insurance claims when individuals uh, strike a, a pole in the middle of the night, uh, that sort of thing. Um, we're also able to track the jobs a little bit easier. So if we want to see the progress of the job, we, and anyone can go in, log in, say, hey, okay, we're waiting on a permit, electrical permit, we're waiting on a state highway permit for flagging. Um, and again, it, it, it is, it's linked into the mapping system, so We'll be able to update the conductor sizes and so forth, which, which will help our engineers uh, you know, uh, evaluate uh, any need for additional capacity on the system. Let's get to the customer information system. Um, again, same as the work management. I, I don't, we don't feel that the, uh, the CIS system we currently use had an electric utility in mind. Um, and so with this, we, we'd like to throw that in the mix as well. Um, there's a lot of advantages here uh, to our customers and the citizens of Hagerstown. Um, so customer service representatives, uh, they open up the system, pull up an account. Everything is, all the customer's information is right there in front of them. They don't have to skip through. Uh, three to five different screens um, to pull up information and, and back out and use other other uh, reporting methods to, to find information about the customers. Um, so a lot of the processes would be streamlined, uh, opening up a, a lot of time for our customer service reps to focus on the customer's needs throughout the day. Um, the, the system is hosted. So in other words, the the hardware involved, the servers, will be off-site. Um, there's an advantage there because it would be more secure for the customers to make payments. All their information would, would not be um, here in the, in the city hall. Um, and also, there's no servers to maintain uh, upgrade as needed. Um, all all the upgrades and so forth would be uh, 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 all a part of the, 
the annual maintenance or monthly ma maintenance fees that go along with this. Um, the web portal that they propose uh, has a, a lot more functionality than what we currently see. The, they're able to select from various different payment methods. Um, passwords are managed by the, the customer. They don't have to call the customer service representatives or email them if, if they lock themselves out of the account. Um, they're able to set up uh, a weekly budget plan um, or, or however they choose to. There's, there's different options there. So if you get a bill that's um, a $90 bill in the mail and you know it's due in three weeks, you can set the system up to automatically draft out $30 a week um, if, if you so choose to. And um, there's also the communications through email and, and text messaging. Um, yeah, your, your bill is ready. Uh, your bill is, is due next week. Um, your bill is paid. Uh, those confirmations will come through a lot easier for, through our customers. <clears throat> the Interactive Voice Response System, or IVR, uh, will link all our phone systems together. Uh, so one phone call um, will you, then you dial the phone, you'll get the robot that tells you what button to hit for the appropriate department. Um, so it won't be, uh, you won't accidentally call the light department for customer service, vice versa. Um, so there'll be less call transfers, um, which will benefit our customers and citizens. Um, People don't like to be transferred several times and tell their story repeatedly to different, different, uh, different employees. Uh, credit card payment payments will be able to be made over the phone. Um, that's not something we can do now. Everything, all phone payments are handled Monday through Friday, except holidays between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, they have to speak directly to a customer service representative. So uh, these automated, this automated method of making payments uh, will provide our customers with the, you know, they, they, they'll be able to make a payment anytime. Um, and that includes uh, property taxes and parking tickets as well, not just utility billing payments. And um, also, this is also a hosted system. Again, so that uh, the communication, your credit card number over the phone um, isn't going through any of the city's um, uh, servers within the building here. They're, they're off-site and secure. Other third-party partners, uh, Invoice Cloud is, um, is the payment processing. So not only, you know, currently we do the credit card bank draft, but uh, Invoice Cloud will also bring in other, other methods of payment, such as Apple Pay, PayPal, et cetera. And they have their own bill reminder, um, text messaging, and emailing service. Uh, and then Text Power is another third party. They're a text service, but they, they don't do the the bill reminders and so forth that Invoice Cloud does. They, they reach out on another level. So looking at our mapping system, the customer service area, a specific, you can, you can pin, uh, pinpoint a specific area and send out a mass text to that specific area to those specific customers. Uh, say if you have a, a planned power outage, uh, you can let them know ahead of time that um, between the hours of uh, 8 a.m. And, and, and 10 a.m., uh, we expect the power to be out for certain upgrades. Um, and this is for citywide use as well. Uh, so it could be used by the uh, West for his press releases, uh, public safety, uh, parks department, engineering department, you, you name it. So the cost to perform this upgrade, uh, the upfront cost for integration into the 
existing system and to set the set their system up the way we we need it to to be to uh, function, uh, you're looking at about uh, fifty-five thousand one hundred ninety-five dollars um, annually. We're projecting approximately uh, seventy-seven thousand seven thirty-six a year. Uh, you break that out, the annual fees for support, and maintenance, and upgrades for just the software portion is uh, just shy of sixty thousand. And the calls, call fees, um, it is on a, it is on a, a so many cents per minute plan. Uh, the call fees, you're looking at $4,800. Uh, text fees, up to 5,000 text messages per month using through the text power. Uh, you're looking at about 5,700. But there's also some savings that we, we expect uh, by moving away from the current customer information provider. Uh, that should uh, cut our budget on that end for about 26,500, we expect. And um, as paperless billing increases, we project if it goes from 10 to 25, we could see additional savings of about $18,000. <clears> payment processing, uh, same with today. We, we looked at September 2020. Uh, those charges were approximately 41,500. So to move from that, um, to move from today's process to our anticipated future process uh, exactly mirrored, it would be about $47,750 projected. Um, and the more people that uh, sign up for paperless billing and bank transfers, you'll, we'll see savings. Um, and that could drop to about $42,500. So, For the annual charges for the work management system, which the light department will, will solely uh, fund, uh, we're, we'll be looking at an additional $18,000 a year. The annual charges for uh, customer information system, the IVR system, um, text power, etc., uh, we anticipate uh, $15,236 additional per year. Now that's subtracting the, the savings um, that we project for paperless billing and, uh, and, and cutting the, ex the existing uh, customer information system that we use. So staff's recommendations, and I'm, I'm fairly comfortable saying it's collectively uh, through the, uh, the light department, the, well, the utilities department, um, IT, customer service, and finance that um, we, we recommend uh, moving forward with this, uh, this software toolbox. Uh, we feel it's a very affordable solution to improve our workflow and communications to our citizens. I thank you for your time this evening. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them the best that I can. I think it's nice we're joining the 21st century. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. We've been looking forward to this for a very long time. I bet. Do you guys have any questions? No, about? I've sat in the utility department when I first came on the council, and I've seen the amount of manual entry, data entry, and, you know, a long list of people online and was shocked that we didn't have this kind of system. So um, I think that it looks fantastic. And I love the fact that parks and, you know, West can send out notifications of street closures especially. So, um, yeah, I think that it's, yeah. I, now, I as, really as, like it. As long as the, the customer has their, their cell phone information mm -hmm. in our utility sure. system, yeah. Yeah, they'll be able to. I'm going to put some people in it. I'm going to make sure that Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do that. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks Thank again. All right, up next we have proposed updates for awarding CDBG public service grant. Lauren. Hey, good afternoon. 
Um, so I'm here just to discuss a couple of proposed updates to um, the CDBG Public Service Grant Review Committee. So as you all know, the city receives CDBG funding through HUD. We typically expend that through capital improvement projects, residential rehab projects, and public service grants. Um, back in 2013, the Mayor and Council approved the framework to create a public service review committee just so there was more accountability in the process. Um, it would be comprised of three members. They would make recommendations on the applications that were received for funding, and then mayor, city staff would then review that and make recommendations to mayor and council to be approved. Um, working recently, we've been trying to identify different areas, though, that we can really increase, increase citizen um, engagement, citizen participation, and transparency. So we decided that this committee was a great opportunity to do so. Um, so we have a couple suggestions in which to improve this process, just to increase those different areas. Um, we suggest uh, updating the name to the um, Community Development Block Grant Citizen Advisory Committee. Um, actually removing the membership requirements just to let anybody, if they're a resident, apply to the city of Hagerstown or apply, apply to the um, committee. And just expanding the role to also assist with um, substantial amendments, other options within the CDBG program. Um, so members will still apply through a basic application just with their interest and we will still take those applications and those interests to mayor and council to approve to sit on the committee for a one to two year term. You guys go with that? No, I'm not. Um, well, maybe. Uh, the last paragraph, <laughs> actually in the first paragraph under background, it says in public service grants to local nonprofit organizations. Yes. Uh, and then it goes on in the third paragraph to talk about who the committee would be made up of. You have a member of the faith-based community, a member of Neighborhoods First, and a low to moderate income resident. That's who it's currently comprised right. of, yes. So when you go to bullet point two, it says, you basically want to open it up to all city residents. Yes. That's how I read that. But then it says, note, eligible applicants cannot be affiliated with any organizations either seeking or receiving CDBG funding. Uh, it doesn't define what affiliated means. Um, so that would, I guess it would depend once an application came through. We would typically look at HUD identifies a conflict of interest as someone who is a board member, an employee. They have direct um, intel within an organization um, that could benefit and could then use that information to create a more successful application or to then push through an application that they had personal gain through. So I guess I'm trying to determine, like, does that mean, a, could it be an individual that receives funding, like, through third-party process from, so, like, let's say you give the money to, I, I don't know, pick an organization, but then the person on your board is getting money from that organization, either for direct benefit uh, uh, use or f uh, if they are a sub-recipient of some program that that entity is using uh, the funding to, to um, distribute the funds. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, how far that word affiliated goes. We could qualify that. We've not ever run into an instance with that, but by opening this up, that could, uh, that could be something that happens. Um, in the past, if we have had someone who maybe would, they might recuse themselves in that situation from providing, typically it's a score. So what they provide is we give them the applications, they review them, they then score them based on sustainability, community impact, and other areas of the application. And then we then rank them when we provide that to mayor and council to review. So we could be an instance where they're recused from scoring that organization and um, they just score the other organizations that have applied. Can we change the wording to say cannot Yeah, and, I mean, I think that helps. The second concern I have, though, is you said with a preference to those that have a social services background. Um, I guess, and maybe this is me generally speaking, I don't, I mean, I see the three sort of different folks you have represented in this current makeup that you're looking to change, but could this become a committee of literally three folks from three different nonprofits, you know, administering these funds to other nonprofits. 
I mean, I'm just not, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with that. I just think that there's such a, a camaraderie within that atmosphere that, that you know, it lends itself uh, uh, to, to a very nebulous uh, uh, um, uh, application of what the word affiliated or conflict, even conflict, means. Uh, I like I liked, or I like, the 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 way that, at least for now, you know, you have different individuals within the community, and I also, frankly, appreciate the fact that there is a low to moderate income individual uh, represented on that committee. I just think it adds perspective uh, to that process that you may lose otherwise if you have three folks that are purveyors of the services versus anyone that's a receiver of the service. But that's my two cents. Anyway, uh, I would be opposed to bullet point two. So. Do you guys have any thoughts? No, I actually <clears throat> believe if we just I have enough faith, I believe, in, in the people who are receiving funds and who administer funds and all those things to, to be careful in what they're doing and not, not create this conflict that, uh, that I think we're afraid of. Are you guys okay with changing the terminology to conflict of interest? Well, and it is a little bit interesting to say with a preference to those that have a social services background and then cannot be affiliated with any organization. So it's kind of like, you know, or conflict of interest. I would imagine that most people with a social services background probably are involved in these organizations. So we can also remove that if you don't want if we don't want to include the preference to social services. That's something that when we did research in other communities, that's kind of a commonplace language that they included in um, equivalent advisory committees. And that could even be a degree in the social services or something like that as well. And I'm with um, Council Member Brucci. Or to say. Um, I, I trust you to make good decisions. You guys good? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right, next, we have proposed CDBG action plan amendment for reallocation of CDBG funds. Hi, Jonathan. Good evening, everyone. So each year, uh, sometimes uh, throughout the year, we review our CDBG uh, budget, especially looking at our capital improvement project funding just for uh, uh, timing of those projects and anticipated groundbreaking, uh, as we are always uh, trying to be cognizant of our CDBG rules and regulations when it comes to timely expenditures of CDBG funds. Uh, and it's commonplace for uh, me to work with Rodney Tissue and his department because most of the capital improvement projects typically uh, funded through C the CDBG program uh, are Rodney's projects uh, through Parks and Engineering. And at the current time, uh, we had some projects funded at the beginning of the fiscal year uh, in the approved CDBG budget that we do think that uh, we should uh, be looking at potential funding shifts uh, to other projects. So generally the first step uh, is working with Rodney on where those projects stand, and then potential maybe uh, replacement projects if we have an issue with a project that's delayed or if, if we feel maybe the project uh, time, time on has changed. Uh, so in the memorandum, we had uh, described uh, a few of those projects that we do think, uh, that we do think are, are uh, up for reallocation of funding due to either the project uh, likely to not move forward or the project is maybe a, a project that should be looked at in a, in a future year. Uh, and with that uh, said, the two projects that they were rec recommending that the, uh, the funding be reallocated is a Memorial Boulevard intersection improvement project. Uh, we did uh, discover uh, after the project was initially planned that some of the most recent demographic data for the beneficiaries of that project would not meet CDBG eligibility. That project was originally budgeted for $70,000 of CDBG funding in the current fiscal year. And then a project that we've had, uh, I believe, in an early planning phase, uh, but with an unknown location uh, and an unconfirmed timeline, was a splash pad park uh, somewhere in the downtown. That project was, was budgeted for $250,000. So again, the first step is, is 
usually working with Rodney on potential replacement projects uh, since it's uh, looking at again parks and engineering uh, CDB parks and engineering project that's uh, that are CDBG funded so we, we seek uh, thoughts from Rodney uh, and his staff on potential parks and engineering projects that would be suitable replacements uh, and some of the projects that are recommended for the reallocation are existing projects and one uh, uh, one project of course has been recently discussed with the uh, approval of the skate park resolution in December of 2020 uh, would, would be one of the recommended projects. So I'll just go down the, the recommended list uh, real quick. And I believe Rodney is there as well. If, if there are questions specifically about the, the, the projects that were existing and then also the, the recommended projects as Rodney can get into more detail, but uh, recommended reallocation of $20,000 of the available funding would be to Helene Park basketball court improvements. That's an existing CDBG project in the current year budget uh, currently budgeted uh, at I believe 25,000, the additional 20,000 would raise the budget for that project to 45,000. Uh, a new project would be uh, funding $100,000 of CDBG funding for Fairgrounds Park fit room bathroom rehabilitation. These are by bathrooms that I believe are 1950s era that are very outdated. Uh, right now, I believe they're used by the fit room users, BMX track users, and uh, patrons of the uh, Fairgrounds Park. Uh, that would be a recommended uh, allocation of $100,000 full complete renovation of those old bathrooms at Fairgrounds Park. And then again, consistent with the mayor and council's resolution that was approved in December would be recommended allocation of $200,000 of the CDBG funding for the skate park project in Fairgrounds Park. So these types of uh, reallocations require a, an amendment through the CDBG program. And if the mayor and council uh, are, are okay with these proposed projects or the proposed plan that's been presented, we would have a 30 day public comment period first and foremost. Uh, it, it's required for an amendment to the CDBG action plan when we're uh, recommending transfers or reallocations of this amount of funding. And then after the comment period, the mayor and city council would then be scheduled to have a amendment uh, vote uh, voted on during the February regular session. So uh, it, that's really the, the summary of it. If Rodney, if you wanna maybe touch on your project uh, uh, thoughts here with with needs and 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 the shifts uh, and and where the uh, the ideas came from with these these recommended projects. Just real quickly, uh, Helene Park has two basketball courts that are um, uh, pretty standard fare. But what we would like to do there is uh, what we did in Wheaton Park, where we coated the court and put up new baskets that are very high quality. We'd like to do that for both the parks and both the, the courts in Helene Park. Um, Secondly, the restrooms at the fit room, um, they're really uh, our 1950s era wooden partitions. Um, yeah, they definitely show their age. Uh, the fit room often hosts uh, different events there that um, they're really not um, of quality enough to, to serve those events. Plus the BMX uh, uses it as well. And they're going to be getting a lot more people there as we hopefully get this national BMX event there um, sometime here in the future. And then, of course, we know about the skate park. I don't need to go into all that, but that's our recommendations to reallocate. Yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. When you use the term reallocate, do you mean postpone or pull? I would say uh, I would say reallocate with uh, again. The, the projects uh, that were listed for the, the funding that was available, I believe the Memorial Boulevard Reynolds Avenue project, that's where Rodney would have to, to weigh in. We'd have to, I, I believe that that's not be eligible for CDBG funding in the future. I think the Splash Pad Park is, again, that's Rodney's answer better than mine. I would say our discussions, it's more viewed as a postpone, uh, but it would have to then obviously be rebudgeted in the future with future CDBG budgets. Uh, so we would, I guess, in essence, postpone the splash pad park uh, planning and project with the current funding budget for it, it would be taken away and, and put into those new uh, project allocations. That's right. So in your long range, let's call it a CIP uh, process, you're not moving any of these projects up, those three projects up and pushing any back. Is that correct? Uh, I, I suppose the skate park was created, but we're not pushing it up. Right. You don't have a six year program that says, hey, these eight projects are gonna happen over the next six years. No. And you're pulling one up and pushing one back. At some point over next year or the year after that, 
something like the splash pad is going to have to come back in and, yep. and, re and literally ask for new money. Right. Yeah. It just where the first project, I think we would probably just cancel yeah. it. I mean, everybody knows I, I support that project. It's, it's unfortunate, uh, you know, when it says that, that it's indefinite. It continues to be held up, you know, frankly, uh, because of the ongoing deliberations of the stadium project. Uh, I mean, that's where it's slated in our approved uh, trail plans uh, to, to go. And, and so I would be much happier if I heard that you had this range plan and one was being pulled up and pushed back. But really what's happening is you're taking it off the table uh, uh, because it is in sort of uh, uh, limbo over another project that hasn't moved forward. Well, it, it's going to, the splash pad will be in the CIP, it'll, but it will be pushed back yeah. uh, probably two or three years, something like that, until we know more definitely what's happening there. Are you guys good with it? Yeah. Good. That's three. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next up, policy addition for Department of Community and Economic Development Programs and Incentives. Caitlin. Hello. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the review committee to seek approval of the recommended following policy to the guidelines of five of our incentive programs through the Department of Community and Economic Development. Those programs are Partners in Economic Progress, our PEP program, the Revolving Long Loan Program, Invest Hagerstown Grant Program, the Facade Grant Program, as well as our new Life Safety Infrastructure Grant Program. These are all DCED programs, and the purpose of those programs is to work in collaboration with our residents, businesses, investors, and visitors to enhance the economy, image, and quality of life in Hagerstown. The policy addition um, that we are attempting to add to our policies um, the purpose is to make sure that all the incentive funds for those five programs are used for their intended purpose that is outlined in the approved development plan and application submitted to our team. Additionally, the policy would encourage safe and code compliant practices when renovating and completing construction downtown. So the proposed policy addition is as follows. For any property that is receiving incentives from the city of Hagerstown through any of the city's programs, the incentive benefits will be immediately suspended if the property, project, or building is condemned due to reasons other than a natural disaster at any time during the agreement and or the benefit period. In order for any of those incentive benefits to be reinstated for any of those programs, those four um, additional steps you see listed would have to be completed in order to be reinstated. Um, at the end of the day, if all of those four steps are actually completed, the review committee would be more than happy to have a reapplication period um, and then encourage that business to finish that program um, and allot those funds at the end of the day. We just want to make sure everybody is doing it safely and code compliant. Yeah, it makes sense. You guys good with that? Yep. Yes. yes. Yep. All right. That was easy. Thank you. Kate. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. All right, we need a motion to go into a special session for the approval of 170 West Washington Partners LLC development plan for sale of the property. So, so moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Madam Mayor, I hereby move for the Mayor City Council to approve the 170 West Washington Partners LLC development plan for the redevelopment of 170 West Washington Street. Approval of the development plan is required by the purchase agreement for the pending sale of the city owned property and required development plan documents are attached. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Five zero. City Administrator. Nothing tonight, Mayor. Thanks. All right. Kristen? Why don't you start down there for a change? All right, Shelly. Yes. <laughs> I was liking that message. I thought it was great. <laughs> I have nothing to do. Just start drawing numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Shelly? No, I don't have anything tonight. Bye. No, Madam Mayor, I'm good. No comments today. I don't have anything. 
Just real quick, because I know we, we pushed Earl back much further than I think we had expected to. Uh, I think we expected to hear from him a little bit more this evening. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to thank him again for coming out. I also wanted to thank Josh, Dr. Joshi for calling me uh, last week. Uh, these two gentlemen that operate uh, in a, a, one of the most critical issues in our community right now uh, are doing so uh, nonstop, uh, both in front of and behind the scenes. Uh, under programs and directives from, from I'm sure, all kinds of bosses, uh, you know, uh, of trying to fix this thing, uh, the pandemic that, that, that we're just simply as citizens not aware of. Um, and, you know, everybody, again, I go back to the fact, and this is what I wanted to say, in my comments this evening, I'm sure that there were a lot of folks that picked up the newspaper a week or so ago and saw an article, you know, where, uh, you know, a number of, of, of those of the vaccine were being provided out that didn't appear to fit within the perfect pyramid uh, that the state directed, you know, uh, would be followed. Uh, and I certainly hear both sides of, of, of that coin, uh, whereby, you know, Dr. Josh is looking at numbers and saying our community is rising. That we have doses that have a certain shelf life. Uh, and if the folks that wanted, that are supposed to get them in 1A aren't coming in, aren't voluntarily doing that uh, in an expedient manner, uh, I got to get these out before they go to waste. And so I appreciate that perspective. I also appreciate the perspective uh, th that Earl put out this evening, whereby saying, look, this isn't an easy process to just go set up on, you know, uh, some building and in some part of the community uh, and, 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 you know, hand out pills because uh, of, of the dynamics uh, of, of the medicine itself. Uh, at the same time, I also understand his sort of rock in a hard place where the state's saying, here's your direction, and the community stewards that, that, that are, you know, looking at the numbers, trying to figure out how to get it out, are saying, we hear your directions, but I'm not sure we can follow them to the letter that you're, you're being directed to direct us to do. Uh, and, and I know that that's, you know, no easy thing. What I will say this, though, is um, in, in, I give the Herald Mail the benefit of the doubt, I think, uh, in this one instance, but, um, you know, if we're going to get information out to the public, uh, understand that a lot of your readers are seniors. Uh, they depend on that information to be delivered uh, in a fair and accurate and, and responsible, uh, responsible manner. Um, and I think when seniors saw that uh, the next morning and thought, oh, wow, they've moved on. Am I getting skipped over? I wasn't aware of this. I don't have Facebook or an email or how to get in to the system and make sure that I get counted uh, and get my call and get in line when I need to. Uh, um, we just need to do better, uh, and the Herald needs to, to, to have a, a situational awareness uh, that this isn't just a story that you're putting in a paper uh, for folks to buy and read. Uh, this is a real critical issue uh, that a lot of seniors that have been cooped up for the better part of the last year uh, read and, and react um, uh, very uh, emotionally to. So. Thank you. I just have two things. One, a reminder that the Hub City 100 Miler kicked off on Saturday. So if you haven't registered, go ahead and walk at least a mile for the next 100 days. And second, our community survey that we've discussed at length was mailed out last week. I know people have already started to receive them and return them back. So make sure you keep your eyes open for that. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you, guys.